help the country's economy have been wasted. Benjamin Sokolov says that some of the money was stolen and much of the rest was used improperly. Now, he says, no more should be handed over to help the Russian economy until it can properly be supervised. His comments come as the International Monetary Fund considers whether to lend Russia another four and a half billion dollars. With Russia's economic crisis taking hold, its people are resorting to ever more desperate measures to earn enough to live on. In the town of Yaroslavl, queues to donate blood have grown in recent weeks. Each donor is given 30 rubles, the equivalent of two US dollars, enough to buy food for a few days. Many here have lost their jobs, others who have them don't get paid. Now Russia's chief state auditor, in effect its chief accountant, says billions of dollars given to Russia to help support its economy has been wasted. Much has gone astray. In July, the International Monetary Fund agreed to give Russia $21 billion to bail out its economy. The chief state auditor has examined what happened to the first tranche of almost $5 billion. He told the BBC, We have checked a fair proportion of the loans, and I'm ashamed to say that several billion dollars has not been used for its intended purpose, and some of it was simply stolen. And he warned that before more money is handed over, first and foremost we have to establish strict financial controls, the kind that exist in any country in Western Europe. One example of misused funds, he claims, involved the supposed sale of Russian MiG fighter aircraft. Mr Sokolov says the finance ministry was given $150 million to fund an export contract for MiG jets, but during his investigations he found the deal was bogus and the money had vanished. Russia's new Prime Minister Yevgeny Primakov has said he'll deal with his country's problems. On Saturday he met with the President of neighbouring Ukraine. The two countries have signed an anti-crisis agreement to look at ways of helping each other. Far more important though is the support of international institutions like the IMF. Russia is currently requesting another four and a half billion dollars from it. Persuading the West to proceed will not be easy until Russia can guarantee that new loans won't be misused. Naming Chromaticus, BBC News. As President's position ever made has begun work as a museum tour guide in the American city of Pittsburgh. The robot and others created by the same scientist are being used as evidence of the rebirth of Pittsburgh as an ultra-modern metropolis. For over a century, this was the grimy capital of smokestack America. Today, Pittsburgh is high-tech, plugged into the 21st century, creating a new breed of intelligent robots. Almost as popular as the dinosaurs at Pittsburgh Museum is Sage, the new tour guide in Jurassic Hall. I'm Sage, world's first self-aware, guided, electro-educator. Sort of like Socrates, Aristotle, Galileo, and Einstein, all rolled into one. The real challenge is to make a robot that exists by itself in a social setting, rather than a robot that leans on humans to help it survive. The robot we have now can survive for six to seven days at a time without requiring our help. Sage is smart enough to send emails to its minders if it develops any internal problems and it's learned to plug itself in for a nightly recharge. This is a robot that weighs 300 pounds, so its designers have made sure that it can't run people down. If you stand in front of it, Excuse me. Sage will maneuver around thanks to the sensors that tell it where to go. At the university next to the museum, Professor Nurbach tries out more of his inventions. Seven robots that sound as if they're farmyard creatures. Quacking, depending on how it quacks, it's actually telling me something about how, they are, uh, how they're doing. So if I'm far away, they quack differently than if I'm close to them. And so it's actually a way for them to give me information. This troop are all prototypes for the toy industry. But the star of the moment is undoubtedly Sage, a robot that's such a hit, a cloned version has just gone on duty in a Washington museum. Brian Barron, BBC News, Pittsburgh. Finally, not just about three type of posters hitting the street, according to its major customer. If you get down to a thousand feet, turning hard in a Eurofighter, you can only be doing so in a defensive mode. The airplane's primary job is to get seven miles high well supersonic, dealing with the enemy at very long range, and then reacting with agile supersonic maneuvers to defeat any threats to it. 
There's no way you can show that at Farnborough because sitting on the ground you won't see what's happening seven miles above you. Russia's excellent thrust vectoring Su-37, along with the Su-35 and 27, are the aircraft that Typhoon was designed to beat, but its critics have always argued that it'll struggle to do so. Eurofighter, I think, from a pilot's viewpoint, will be easier to operate, but it is going to be up against an airplane that carries a lot more weapons, flies a lot further, has a much greater radar range, and in the end, it's going to spend a lot on tactics development. If they come up against a, an Su-27 operator who really knows how to use that aircraft, it's going to be a pretty serious fight. The threat posed by the Su-37 has been modelled and analysed in depth on the Joust simulator at the Defence Evaluation and Research Agency, or DIRA, at Farnborough. Air engagements are very similar, and we found over extensive studies Using this sort of facility that you see behind me, we found the real key is the ability to get supersonic and then supersonic agility, the ability to climb, dive and turn supersonic. And Eurofighter is the first aeroplane in the world to really use that as the key criteria in design. In the interests of impartiality, we tried to find someone who still thinks Typhoon hasn't got what it takes. We couldn't. When I first came to Farnborough 48 years ago, Venom and Viscount, Canberra and Comet were the stars of the show. It was the golden age of British aviation when scores of independent companies, Gloucester, Blackburn, English Electric, and others long gone, displayed to the world. Today, the customers are still here, and billions of dollars worth of business is done. But the successors to those great names of the past, Airbus and Eurofighter, for example, are the product of joint ventures between corporations and countries. I asked John Crampton if the change was inevitable. I think it was. You have to have uh, a number of countries collaborating, a number of companies collaborating to find the money to develop some of these new programs. Aircraft today are so sophisticated, so expensive to develop, we have to address that, and no individual company can, is really still capable of doing that.